Hello, welcome everyone to our conversation today about how poetry can amplify marginalized voices. My name is Lindsay Smith. I direct the Center for Poets and Writers at OSU Tulsa, and I'm really honored to be able to host this discussion along with my colleagues, Koresh Ali Lansana and Janine Joseph. Um, we're going to be talking today about how poetry can elevate and amplify voices that might otherwise not be included in important conversations and whether those are national conversations and I would also add conversations within the publishing industry so I'm really excited for um, the discussion today. I want to mention that this is the beginning of a new series um, that will be a collaboration between the Center for Poets and Writers and the new Center for Truth, Racial Healing and Transformation that um, our, our friend and colleague Q is spearheading with OSU Tulsa. We will have an, a, an official May 6th launch date for the, our TRHT Center. For, so I encourage you to keep your eyes peeled for more information um, about that event. Today, I'm joined by poets with local ties, Amirani Perez Shamu, Fitodi Mashari, Edder J. Williams McKnight are our featured guests. And my colleagues, as I said, Janine Joseph and Karesh Ali Lansana. These folks all have amazing accomplishments and backgrounds, and I'm going to walk you through um, their bios and listen carefully, it might take a minute, but it's important to share all that these folks bring to our conversation today. So Amirani is the Hispanic Resource Center Coordinator for the Tulsa City County Library, where she is in charge of managing the Spanish collection and programming for the Latinx community in East Tulsa. She serves as the president of the board of directors for the East Tulsa Main Street District and is a multidisciplinary artist in poetry and film. Fitodi is an advocate for the power of love, words, and wisdom, and the evolution of the individual for the benefit of the collective. Poetry is his lifelong passion. Fitodi is the owner of New Greenwood LLC, which published Release Me, The Spirits of Greenwood Speak. He's a Tulsa Artist, Fellow, uh, Tulsa Artist Fellowship Fellow, and a Greenwood Art Project artist. He's a curator, performing artist, civil rights activist, poetry slam champ, award-winning actor, author, copywriter, songwriter, host, and speaker from Tulsa. He earned his Bachelor of Business Administration from Langston. He's a member of Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity, and he mentors young people as a member of 100 Black Men of Tulsa. He's on the Poetry Spoken Word Committee at Living Arts, and he conducts poetry workshops and occasionally participates in the Artists in the Schools program with AHA Tulsa. He writes like righteousness and sin are at the whim of his pen. Edder J. Williams McKnight is an educator and poet residing in Tulsa since 2014. She teaches at Holland Hall in the Upper School English Department. She has collaborated with local visual and performance artists to produce poems featuring Black Wall Street and the Tulsa Race Massacre, which have been performed live in various venues and have appeared in Art Focus Oklahoma Magazine and Oklahoma Today Magazine. She received an MFA in poetry from Stone Coast at the University of Southern Maine in 2015. She has produced two handbound art books, But Move Not from 2012 and a burlap room from 2013 with artist Suzanne Sawyer of Down Home Girl Studio. Janine Joseph is a poet and librettist from the Philippines. She is the author of Driving Without a License, winner of the Kundiman Poetry Prize, and Decade of the Brain, which is forthcoming in 2023 from Alice James Books. Her poetry, essays, and critical writings have recently appeared in The Nation, The Georgia Review, Orion, Pleiades, The Atlantic, Copper Nickel, Poets and Writers, and The Poems Country, Place and Poetic Practice. Her commissioned work for the Houston Grand Opera includes In Our Care, What Wings They Were, On This Muddy Water, Voices from the Houston Ship Channel, and From My Mother's Mother. 
a co-organizer co for Undocu Poets and a McDowell Fellow. Janine is an assistant professor of creative writing at Oklahoma State University. Quraysh Ali Lansana is the author of eight books of poetry in addition to textbooks and works for children. A former faculty member of both the writing program of the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and the drama division of the Juilliard School, Lansana served as director of the Gwendolyn Brooks Center for Black Literature and Creative Writing at Chicago State University and was an associate professor of English and Creative Writing. His work, Our Difficult Sunlight, A Guide to Poetry, Literacy, and Social Justice in Classroom and Community with Georgia A. Popoff, was published in March 2011 by the Teachers and Writers Collaborative and was a 2012 NAACP Image Award nominee. His most recent books include The Whiskey of Our Discontent, Gwendolyn Brooks as Conscience and Change Agent, and The, Bre and the Breakbeat Poets, New American Poetry in the Age of Hip Hop. Lansonant's work appears in Best American Poetry 2019, and he's also a Tulsa Artist Fellow. I also wanna mention, I know that there, was an, there have been many events around town celebrating Opal's Greenwood Oasis, which Q collaborated on with a couple of colleagues. Um, and the list of all these things that these people are involved with just goes on and on. And so there's so much talent and energy and creativity represented in the folks um, in this Zoom call. And I'm just so um, pleased and um, my heart is just full with how they are so tied to our community, living here and working here and mentoring others. So um, thank you so much all for being here. And I'm now I'm gonna turn things over to my colleagues, Janine and Krish. Thank you, Lindsay. And it is my hope, um, and thank you for introducing all of our guests. Um, and it is my hope that in the coming months we'll be um, featuring your forthcoming title. Um, <laughs> and the important work that you are engaged in um, in indigenous literature. So um, we're looking forward to to that, and and then we'll be interviewing you. We'll be talking to you. <laughs> um, but thank you again um, for that, and thank all of you for joining us. Um, and it is um, it's a beautiful thing that all of us reside in in this this crazy state, and we're still managing to make sense of our lives and attempting to make sense of others lives in a in a state where it is now legal to run protesters over without consequence so but don't get me side where that's a part of the whole um about this idea right because even that if you think about it that is literally and figuratively suppressing a marginalized voice i can run a truck over you in the street for raising your voice for using your voice Right. And I can go home and take a shower and you, you're, you're in the hospital or maybe worse. Right. If that's not literally and figuratively what we're here to talk about today. Right. I don't I don't know. I don't know what is. But let's talk about this idea of right of I mean, for many of us, I would assume a part of well, I won't assume I'll ask is the idea of providing a voice for the voiceless, providing uh, shining a lens on marginalized communities, a part of how you found yourself in arts and in poetry in the first place? What do you think, Amarani? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I would say absolutely for me. I, I had to come out twice. I'm both um, lesbian and also <clears throat> undocumented and having to have that experience I came out so that I could give a voice to those that don't have the ability yet to, to let others know that they are undocumented or, or about their sexual orientation. Um, I feel very empowered that in my ability to express myself, to live my life and to um, uh, work in the community as an organizer, I can elevate voices that haven't yet had the opportunity. And so whether that be like um, working as an activist, that is always the drive and my passion. And when I write, I also write thinking about my community, thinking about my family, thinking about my friends, my neighbors, all of the people that don't have um, 
don't yet have that courage to step up and say, hey, um, I am undocumented or hey, I am gay. And it's just something, it's, it's a big step in our lives. And I just feel so much privilege in being allowed to, to live my life fully. And, and I feel like I have to pay that respect to others as well. And, and it's just, it's a very empowering, empowering aspect for me as, as a writer and as a person. I mean, and thank you for that. That's wow. Um, and I know that uh, we'll, we will circle back to, 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 to everything you just said, but something that's coming up to me as well is that you're also a librarian. You have the opportunity to inform, to actually provide, right, materials, select and provide literature for your community that you feel like will be uplifting or empowering um, to, to your community. I mean, what, is that, what does that feel like? Um, just recently, actually, a family came in and they were like, thank you so much for the books that you're putting into the collection. And I, I felt so just humbled, so, so happy that I'm able to curate a collection for my community. And a really, really important thing is representation for me and seeing books come across my desk that look like people like me. And, you know... Yeah. I'm just thinking of all like um, small children that pick up a book and they can see themselves reflected in something. How much of a difference that would have made in my life yeah. had I been able to have that opportunity. And, you know, we just have to like continue working through those barriers. And luckily with my job, I get to um, choose books and just ensure that everything in the collection reflects the community that I'm working in. and. They're all in Spanish. So that means that uh, regardless of your native tongue, you can come and you can pick up a book that you can read and that you can take home. So it's just so special for me to be able to do that. Yeah, that's that's real power right there. That's 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 the business, right? That's that's why that's the business. That that brings me great joy. Um what who else? For Toti, what do you think? What did you find yourself into this, this art and poetry world in part because of this question we're, we're, we're kicking around today? Yes, thank you for the invitation, Therese, and thank you for the, for the introduction, Lindsay, and thank you for everyone who, who's on the panel. Thank you for your voices and for the work you do. I'm Ronnie, you have a beautiful name. I love, I love just saying, it's poetic just saying your name. Anyway, yes, <laughs> to answer your question, yes, I got it. I started writing poetry. I, I feel the the poet is the advocate for the captive. If you want to, if you want to express yourself, it's a, a poet usually expresses your feelings for you in a way. A, a poet expresses how you feel in a way that you may not be able to express it. That's why greeting cards are a million billion dollar business. We tell you know you buy a greeting card because a poet tells you you know, tells your loved one, this is how I feel about you. I'm feeling exactly this at this moment. I don't know how to say it, but this is how I feel. And a poet provides that. A poet provides that during graduation, during bereavement times, and during times whenever there's, um, whenever there's uprising, whenever there's a, a, a conflict in the community, a poet writes about it. Now, a poet may not always publish it. It could come in the form of a, a diary or a manuscript that someone just keeps to themselves, but it is written somewhere. You know, what's going on, what's happening in, in whatever time period, it is being written somewhere by a poet, whether they acknowledge themselves or call themselves poets or not, they write it in verse. And I, and I feel that, you know, some of us, for some of us who are, you know, who, who are bold enough or feel emboldened enough to speak that truth to power, to speak what, what the um, the masses, or at least part of the masses, are feeling, it's a it's a duty, it's a responsibility, it's a calling, it's a must. If I don't do it, I'm not right. I don't feel right. I can't just allow someone to be murdered on on television for the world to see. I can't not speak about that. I cannot not speak about that. And I believe a lot of writers and poets and activists and artists feel the same way. 
Okay, thank you for that, uh, brethren. Eder, um, what is, how does this, how did that question sort of what, fit on your skin? How is that? Well, uh, first, I'm, I mean, I got to piggyback on Amarani and Patote, and I also want to just thank you for inviting me in. And I want to thank OSU Tulsa, and I want to thank all of the organizations that had anything to do with putting this on. Um, thank you for reading our intros. This is very much a blessing and a pleasure to be able to talk poetry and the power of it. And I feel like that's going to lead me into, so I'm just going to go ahead and start throwing in a poem cue because it's so small. Okay. But to answer the question, I think it is seeing other poets um, give me permission to speak because they validated humanity in so many ways that they were saying to me, you can do this too. You can write what you want. You can write yourself. And one of the early people who did that for me was um, Ruth Foreman. And I, I picked up this or I was gifted this book a thousand years ago. And she has this one, it's called We Are the Young Magicians. She has one poem in there, it has two lines, okay? And it's called For Your Information. And it's almost like you can see her doing her head like this in the title, right? And she says, poetry is always for the people and it is always a time of war. And so what she, uh, ignite it for me, or I guess more so um, added more fire to what was in me was that sort of warrior spirit of a poet. Um, and that poet, you know, will throw down, poetry will throw down bombs, you know, and the spoken word as well as the written word, and sometimes it together has the ability to slay um, because the truth is so laser like in it, um, or it's so affirming, or it's so you know, unnerving. Um, and poetry has that ability to do that as well as give beauty as well as offer love. So all of that is happening, you know, in these little things we call poems. And that's really all I can say. I can't say, you know, that, oh, I feel this need to fill a gap so that in our, you know, social space, my voice is heard. It wasn't so much that it was more like you feel that impulse. And then you had these other writers, you know, starting from Maya Angelou all the way to, you know, many I could name who open the door for you and say, here, go to the stage and stand on it and speak, or here's your pen, please write. Um, so I want to just add that piece to it. We can talk more about various poems when you're ready for us to. Oh, well, any Ruth is always welcome because Ruth, Ruth is great people. Um, happy to call her friend. So I'm, and that book is an amazing book. Janine, what are you thinking? Where, where's your head? You want to um, chime in or you want to lead us in another direction? Well, I do want to chime in um, simply because this was a question. Uh, I'm really glad that you posed this question, Q, because uh, something I'm always interested in um, are, are people's origin stories, but their origins as a poet story. Um, and I'm always really interested in um, what amplification actually looks like. Right. Um, like, what does it mean to commit something to pen and paper or to um, to to stand and voice something? And what does what where does amplification fit in? And so some of the things that I was writing down as I was listening to everybody speak, you know, this idea of like curation. Right. Like, I really love that. And thinking about am amplification um, in terms of curation and the power of librarians, which I feel like every single year it feels like there's this question of you know like what do we need librarians for and right here in this particular moment right like we are seeing the power of librarians and what what it can do for um young readers and young writers um i also noted too right like i love this idea of 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 the greeting card um which i feel like we always tend to resist to because you know, someone else has provided the words, but something that I find that I do when I get a, when I do buy a greeting card is I always add language to the existing language that's there, right? So it provides this kind of like foundation that I just, I circle and I draw and I, you know, it ends up looking like, um, like a football play, right? Like, <laughs> cause I have just lines going everywhere and I'm adding things to it. And I'm thinking too about how text can be, can be a spark right? That there's a kind of existing text that tries to speak for everybody, but doesn't, right? And it invites me to, to write alongside it and to add my own stuff. Sometimes I cross out everything, <laughs> right? Like <laughs> I look at what's existing there and, and it, it's important that, that I'm crossing out what currently exists on, on that page, right? 
Um, so I really love this idea of curation and spark. And then to this, um, you know, thinking through like the, the permission to speak and by validating, and, and I kind of had this like image as you all were speaking about how, um, you know, as uh, how poetry is this kind of a uh, heat source that once we, we feel it, we're drawn to it. Right. And it and I keep thinking about um, how we how we feel ourselves to be human. Right. Like draw, being drawn to a heat source um, that, you know, someone else might 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 create this kind of like spark or might have this like flame that will warm us um, and uh, and kind of remind us or, or make us feel like we're human all over again. And so, um, you know, just all these things that have been floating around. Um, as you all have been speaking and um, it's, it's kind of like helping me visualize uh, all of your origin stories, right? All of your, your poet origin stories, if we're going to go with this like poetry and poets and superheroes, <laughs> these are your origin stories. It's really, really lovely. I love um, that. <laughs> we might need to do that. Yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Keep going. No, no, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, that, that, that could be like a great anthology. Like, how you came to poetry or how poetry came to you, you know, your your journey with verse, you know, that'd be interesting. Actually, I, I'd read that book. Maybe we need to do that. Janine. Yes, yes, yeah. Maybe we need to do that. <laughs> That's cool. Um, and one of the things I think that all of you, that uh, Fatoti said in something about, you know, I think all of you in, 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 in different ways, I, it led me to think about the fact that in the 20th century, so many literal revolutions were led by poets, right? You know, Eastern Europe, Francophone Africa, parts of West Africa, Chile, Argentina. I mean, so many places where the revolutions were actually led by the wordsmiths, right? Um, and if that doesn't speak to, you know, the power of language, um, to lead, right? Folks didn't follow King or Hitler because they were good looking. It's because they the, the powerful use of language, you know what I mean? They could use words to move people. Um, so let's talk about, let, so let's to that end, let's let's hear some of the a poem that you selected by another poet uh, um, that you feel like um, speaks to that kind of movement of speaking to, for or, or for marginalized voices. Um, let's see, we ended with Janine. So, um, and Edder just read. So, um, Amirani, would you read, um, and tell us a little bit about the poet you selected and why this poem sort of falls under this, this, this topic. Absolutely. So I chose a poem from this, uh, Breakbeat Poets anthology called Latinx. And my author is Jonathan Mendoza. Um, he writes a little bit on nationalism and he starts out his poem uh, with a breakout poem from Woody Guthrie's This Land is Your Land. And I was just immediately drawn to what he was able to create from breaking up the words. And so I'll start with that and then I'll go a little bit into some portions of the poem because it's quite long, um, but I do encourage everybody to read it. It's called On Nationalism. And so here we go. This land is land, is land is land. The island, the forest, the waters. America made that highway and saw endless gold. America made me roam and ramble and follow footsteps to her diamond. America made a high wall there to stop me. A sign said private property. It didn't say for me, I was the dust. Chanting the God America made one morning. Stood hungry, wondering if I, America made me. America was not founded by immigrants. Immigrants found America and dropped the name on it like a drone. I do not tout the phrase we are all immigrants because everyone is not one. Some were born here. Well before the nation was a nation, just earth brown enough to call a home. I don't mind immigration, just do it the legal way, said the offspring of a colonist. I am not American because I am proud. I am American despite bombing seven countries, 
despite exploited labor, despite Palestine, El Salvador, Guam. I do not need to wave an empire's flag to prove I am deserving of a life. I do not need a status nor a paper to tell me who is or is not worthy of survival. I cannot pry the nation nor the journey required to arrive. I cannot pry the heat nor the drownings nor the waves of our bombs punching entire families to the shore. What I pride is the day a sail grew out of our grandmother's back and a compass from our grandchildren's throat. I pride a people and their people and all the sand from which we dare to rise. And that was on nationalism by Jonathan Mendoza. A sail from my grandmother's back. Woo! Okay. I will have to, I'll have to read this poem um, sometime today. Thank you for that. Wow. Um, for Toadie, what did you, what did you bring as a, as a, as a poem to, to share in this regard? Thank you. And thank you for sharing, Amarani. Thank you. I chose A.J. Smitherman. And A.J. Smitherman, this particular piece is from, it's from Eulogy to the Tulsa Martyrs by A.J. Smitherman. And this poem is also a preamble to the foreword to Release Me the Spirits of Greenwood Speak. And the foreword is written by Koresh Ali Lansanao, my mentor. And this is the poem. If I could stand in the midst of dead bodies, brave black men who fell in the Tulsa riot and massacre, as martyrs to the greatest cause it has ever been human privilege to espouse, I would lift up my eyes in adoration and gratitude to the great God of the universe who gave us their being and my voice to their fellow man throughout this broad land. And on behalf of a grateful race, pay homage to their blessed memory. By way of eulogy, it may well be said that because of them, the hope of our race looms brighter and the world has been made some better. Not because they lived in it, but because they died as they did true martyrs to a sacred cause, fighting against overwhelming odds and without hope of surviving the conflict, these men gave their all that a great principle might triumph. Tis better to fight and die if need be than to live if to live is to compromise manhood and to sacrifice the sacred things that life is made of. That's from the eulogy to the Tulsa Martyrs by A.J. Smithen. And will you briefly share who he was so folks understand the con a bit more of the context? Yes. A.J. Smitherman was one of the founding members of Greenwood, along with O.W. Gurley and the, Green the Greenwood District, which is also known as Negro Wall Street, also known as Black Wall Street. And he was also a, a journalist. He was a poet. He started, he started newspapers wherever he went. He, he traveled different places. And he, in each place he went, he planted seeds of, of, of news, poetry, and how to spread the happenings of what's going on in the, in the, he was the voice for the time, for the places and the people where he was at the time. I'll put it that way. And he, he, he did that through journalism and poetry. Thank you, brethren. Janine, um, what, did, what poet did you select, poem, poet you select? I selected one of my favorite, one of the greats, Miss Lucille Clifton. Um, and I actually decided to just to go back to a poem that I've been carrying with me probably since high school. Um, I too grew up undocumented and um, I don't even know where it was that I came across this poem because I do remember um, that there were only just a few collections of poetry in my high school. I, my, my parents thankfully always took me to the library and so I was always able to um, 
to check out books that I couldn't find in my high school library. I think we had um, Sarah Teasdale and like Leaves of Grass um, in, in our poetry stacks in my high school. And so I think it must have been at the library, um, at the public library that I found uh, Lucille Clifton's work. And this is the this is one that gets circulated quite a bit, but it's uh, it's I've been carrying it with me all these years. And it's, won't you celebrate with me? Won't you celebrate with me what I have shaped into a kind of life? I had no model. Born in Babylon, both non-white and woman, what did I see to be except myself? I made it up here on this bridge between starshine and clay. My one hand holding tight my other hand. Come celebrate with me that every day something has tried to kill me and has failed. Ashe, Mama Lucille, Ashe, Ashe, oh, Mama Lucille. Yeah, at, at some point, Janine, you and I are going to have to sit down and, and share stories. Um, that, that woman is one of the women who changed my, my, my whole life. Uh, and I'm blessed to have been, been mentored by her befriended and guided by her. Um, and every and you're right, that poem is widely circulated, widely, widely published, but every time it just it 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 does it does what good art does, right? Or what good art should do, right? Which it makes you yes. feel, right? It moves you to feel, it moves you to think, right? Um, why we listen to 100 year old music, right? Because it moves us to feel and it moves us to think, you know what I mean? So you, uh, yeah, I'll shame Mama Lucille. Um, all right, so all of you have talked about representation. Um, how, what are the ways in which poetry, and I think we've all failed to mention this National Poetry Month, so, um, but, how does poetry work with and or against representation, right? Um, and how does poetry with your work or in the larger sense um, engage with the notion of representation? Um, Ed, or what, do you, what, do you, what do you think? Man, I've got a thousand thoughts, Q. We need more time. <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, I was trying to figure out which direction to go in. Like you're a DJ, you know, it's like, you know, where are we at? Where are we at? Are we here at Langston Hughes? Are we here at Martina Espada? Um, are we here again at Ruth? And your question is so big, it's so profound. I, I want to lead off with a po another poet's work. Is that is that good? Um, and one thing that you, when you first asked me to come in, you, you were remembering that I teach and I teach students. And um, Amirani earlier was talking about how, you know, gosh, to have representation in this library where you can walk in and see yourself and it's not so an other, it is the center, is everything, right? I grew up in libraries as well. I believe in libraries. They are the great democratic um, denominator. Um, but I also think, that you need to walk into someone else's space and see that they are the norm, even if it's not you. Um, so it is really important, I think, that we are hearing other people's stories and it's, we are not at the center of that story all the time, if that makes sense. Um, one of the things I do then in my class, which is majority white, you know, I teach at, a, at Holland Hall, um, and to me, I'm just like, you're gonna hear from a whole lot of folks and poetry allows you to do that. And so one of the ones that I used to teach um, a persona poem, and this is Martin's Jorge, the church janitor finally quits. Um, because like Jorge puts it down and he's just funny and witty and he has a bad attitude and we just sort of love that, right? Um, so I'm just gonna read that because this is where we are right now. So this is Martin Espada and you can find this in Alabanza. Um, he also has a new book that's out right now. Um, so you might wanna check that out. Jorge, the church janitor finally quits. Cambridge, Massachusetts, 1989. No one asks where I am from. 
I must be from the country of janitors. I have always mopped this floor. Honduras, you are a squatter's camp outside the city of their understanding. No one can speak my name. I host the fiesta of the bathroom, stirring the toilet like a punch bowl. The Spanish music of my name is lost when the guests complain about toilet paper. What they say must be true. I am smart, but I have a bad attitude. No one knows that I quit tonight. Maybe the mop will push on without me, sniffing along the floor like a crazy squid with stringy gray tentacles. They will call it Jorge. And my class would have a debate about, did he mean they call it Jorge or did they mean they call it, he'd call, they call it George? So they're picking up right. on how, you know, we don't see people who work for us, serve us, um, not understanding they have a whole globe of experience um, that we could learn from, share, and, and et cetera. That's part of the education that we should be having. Right. Um, so anyway, that's the one I wanted to make sure, one of the ones I wanted to put out there. Yeah, that's such an incredible poem. And it's, again, to the idea of the question, the idea of representation. Um, Jorge is invisible. They only miss him when there's no toilet paper. He only mm -hmm. exists, right? Mm -hmm. uh, when the floors are dirty. Otherwise, he just, he's non-existent. Mm -hmm. He's a non-person, mm -hmm. right? <sighs> wow, yeah. Um, Vitoti, what do you think about this idea of representation? It is imperative that our voices are, are represented by, by in the same language by the same people who speak that language, who, who, live, who live the um, experiences, you know, it, no matter who they may be, it's important to hear that voice from you, you know, from, from people who look like you, who, from people who, who feel like you. So not, and sometimes it's not even a demographic. Sometimes it's a psychographic. It could be someone who feels the way you feel, someone who believes like you, that, and they may look totally different, but they may feel the way you feel about something. And it's important to have that representation of a, in a psychographic, from a psychographic sense, if you will. Yeah. Um, Arani, uh, Janine, you wanna jump in here? Um, I have always, believe that we all have different backgrounds, perspectives, experiences, and we all have our own lenses. So when it comes to representation, the things that I have learned from hearing others speak on their narrative and their stories have impacted my life so that I can learn and that I can grow. And I'm not just stuck in my own lens. And so I, I truly love that about poetry and about writing that it gives, us, um, it gives us insight into what other people are experiencing. And, you know, in hearing, I have learned so much in rooms where people are performing their own pieces. They, I think just people are like bleeding out their words onto pen and paper and it's just so passionate and so motivated and it just comes straight from the heart and to be able to, sit there and experience and to be in this room today, even though it's virtual, like I can hear all of the passion that you're putting into these pieces and how they have moved you. And I think on representation, we just, the more per perspectives we have, the more, the more collective thought we can just have on different issues. And we're not just stuck in our own little bubble our worlds expand exponentially with poetry and with words. Janine, thank you. So I'm always thinking about um, 
representation and also access, because something that I learned um, when I was writing was that um, there were spaces that I was not allowed to access simply because of things like eligibility guidelines um, that uh, that say, you know, uh, prevented me from even, you know, say submitting my manuscript or submitting my poems somewhere or sending my poems to contests because they would say in the guidelines, you know, you must be a U.S. citizen, right? And so I think about these spaces that now um, I am able to occupy and what that then means when I look around and how it is that I help um, or I tried to help open the doors behind me and keep those doors open. You know, like I carry still with me, um, you know, something Toni Morrison has said about like reaching these spaces um, and, and, and getting jobs and again, like occupying spaces um, and how your, your, your real job is to uh, free someone else and to help someone else into these spaces and that it's not a, as soon as you get there, you shut the door as quickly as you can behind you and you keep everything for yourself. Um, and so I'm always trying to think about, because again, I'm always aware that I that I reach these spaces and I begin to occupy these spaces, especially now um, that were not designed for me, right? Uh, like I think about people who, who write these guidelines, who write these laws, who write these rules, um, who who could not have ever dreamed of a person like me, right? <laughs> they, that somehow they, they just didn't have the foresight, um, which again is like why I think even things like curation, right? Like one of the reasons too that I love um, turning back to Lucille Clifton's work is I, I like to sit there and think like, did she know at that time that she was writing, you know, who she thought she was going to reach and then who that poem was reaching in that particular moment and then who that poem has continued to reach and who it might reach um, even beyond, you know, even beyond my time and even beyond me. Um, and so, yeah, I'm always thinking about uh, um, representation, but then always access, right? And trying to trying to dream further than where I am in my present moment for all the people who I'm not yet imagining might be in this space and trying to make sure that I'm still leaving those spaces and those doors open for them or that I'm leaving something behind that might spark something to bring them, right, to, to this like core heat. Right, like leaving that core heat. That speaks to Lindsay's question that she had before we started. Lindsay, do you want to put that out there? You, you was particularly rooted in publishing. And I think Janine, this idea of representation and access, Janine just sort of blew open the door. But where were you going to go with that? Yeah, um, thank you so much. I, I was just thinking as you all were speaking that um, for many of you, the library, um, was so important for sort of empowering you and giving you access to the kinds of spaces Janine was talking about. Um, I've really noticed in my work in the classroom, and I know you know so many of us are educators, um, all of us are educators in, in one form or another. Um, whenever it comes to the poetry part, I see the looks of terror, you know, <laughs> on their faces. I can't do it. You know, they come to the table with this, you know, fear of poetry. And even in Native American Lit Literature Book Club, which we uh, meet every month, we always have to take turns like, oh, Lindsay's going to be bringing up a poetry book, you know, <laughs> we have to kind of talk each other through it. And so um, I think it's related, though, to this question of, um, um institutions the publishing industry the way that people feel um disconnected from poetry that it's too hard that it's not for them um and i a lot of poets i think feel some some of what amirani was saying about just the passion the the empowerment really in the space of performance not even so much necessarily just in the space of the book itself and so I feel like students, I'm always trying to really encourage them to go to live events or find another way to connect with poetry um, besides just being in my class and going through it line by line. <laughs> um, and so I, I guess maybe one way of framing this as a question is, um, how have you guys found um, the excitement 
um, and the access to poetry and how have you found ways to share it with others um, even though poetry sometimes is inaccessible a lot of big publishing houses don't even really do much poetry because they just feel like people don't want to buy it um but yet at the same time poetry has obviously just been so meaningful and empowering for you so how you know how how have you um come to it and found your way um with poetry specifically Thank you, Lindsay. I, I, I'll answer from my point of view. It's by um, continuously continuing to write, and as as far as the as far as the um, publishing houses not feeling that that poetry would sell, I got tired of submitting my stuff to other people and putting my destiny in other people's hands. So I started my own publishing company. And there are, I believe there are, well, I know there, there are many, many poets and authors who self-publish now. We don't have to be at the mercy of someone else. We can, if we have a voice and we have something to say, we say that and we write it and we publish the work, whether one person hears it or reads it or, or a million people see it or read it, it is published, it is immortalized, that message is out there and we have to speak. We have to, we have to, as, as poets, as writers, as artists, we have to express ourselves. And sometimes we have to do that just by, you know, if there's no table for us to come to, we have to build the table. Anyone else want to um, speak to uh, Lindsay's question? Okay, I I I, I, he, I hear thinking, <laughs> but I don't hear mouths moving. So um, if something comes to mind, uh, jump. On. <laughs> um, but we have, we have about twelve minutes left, and I want to make sure that we get in. We have time for each of you to read one of your original poems um, regarding um, this idea of of providing a uh, voice for marginalized people, marginalized communities. But a thought that came to mind very quickly, um, I wanna share, which is that, you know, we have all been around artists and I taught at the School of the Art Institute in Chicago, of Chicago for five, seven years, um, where there are folks who believe in the idea of creating art for art's sake, right? And I have to, and, you, and, and it's easy to, I mean, it's easy for us to say, well, no, we as, as uh, marginalized people, we as BIPOC people, we as, uh, as, as LGBTQA folks, we who are not represented even in children's books, that there are more animal char lead characters of children's books that are animals than are black and brown children, right? That's true, going back to the to publishing industry and representation. But thinking about, I also think about that, you know, the beef between the black arts movement and the black writers um, who were not a part of that moment, uh, actually initially like Rita Dove and uh, Charles Rao from Callaloo and others who were not engaged in black arts movement work because they were like, we're black and if I wanna write a poem about a rose, I'm black and I'm gonna write a poem about a rose. It doesn't have to be political. So then, so then it makes you pull back and say, okay, so, I personally don't believe that, and I've never believed in art for art's sake, but on the other hand, as a historian and understanding that history, right, wanting to be sensitive to the fact that, well, you can write what you want to write. I believe I can't, I can't afford it. I don't have the luxury, right? So very quickly, very, very quickly, y'all speak to that like popcorn, Ed or go. My first one that I was going to share with you was Langston Hughes, and I feel like there's a way in which he navigates all that all that world that he wrote what he wanted to write. He wrote of the people he represented. He went communist. He did the whole shebang for his whole life. Right. Um, and I kind of feel like I'm not interested in dichotomies of what you get to write for and why you write. Is it art for art's sake or is it because it's for political? You know, um, and maybe I have the luxury to do that because of those who came before me, who paved the way for me, right? But um, I feel like 
the fire of poetry becomes political, it becomes personal, it's all the things because being a human is political and it is personal and all of that. And so dust poetry is a manifestation of that. So I'll pass the mic. Okay, I'm Arani, go. I also agree with everything that Edder said. I think um, I haven't really believed in writing poetry for art's sake, but I think that when we write, we just write on our experience and that just becomes personal. And oftentimes then it becomes political. It becomes just a piece that speaks on so many subjects. So yeah, I just it just flows as it flows for me. Tony, succinctly. <laughs> Okay, I don't. I don't believe that that artists create just for art's sake. With the with the rate that humans destroy flowers, it's important to know for a poet to write about what a rose looks like, because who knows if a rose will be here fifty years from now, and a sunset and a a, a meadow. So it's. A, I don't see it. I don't think it's art for, for art's sake. I think it's art. The purpose is just different, but just as important as political. Okay, Janine. I, I believe that there is space for all of it, but I also believe that it's all political. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so then we'll probably go a few minutes over, but let's hear some poems to, to, to take us home. Um, so it can't be, can't be your most epic. Um, so maybe it's an excerpt. If it's uh, you know, if you your version of the the, the Odyssey, but uh, Amarani, why don't you start us off? Of course, um, I'm. This is called modern modern justice, and on in light of the recent Chauvin trial, um, I was just resonating with it a lot. The body deconstructed becomes currency. Every organ laid bare and malleable into dollar signs. The descendancy of my skin implanted in my tongue, my voice extracted under the assumption of crimes. Thick accent and hair I inherited from my mother garners no significance to officers that smell like the morgue. In a country of fabricated fables, how do people understand suffering when it's not a Facebook filter or a podcast on NPR.org? The monopoly on my heritage mingles with the candidates, political platforms betting on my country of birth and lifespan. As though you could debate logic and humanity with those who breed conspiracy with the sight of a caravan. In the land of liberty, they feed you apple pie, a dry crust filled with generational poverty and suggestions from the recruiter to not even bother to apply. As a child, I was never scared of the dark or the boogeyman. And in America with no love for black or tan, I learned to fear the badges that were members of the Klan. Under constant vigilance, even the strongest can succumb to assimilation, especially when it's wrapped in acceptance, decorated with do not cross and caution and brightly colored tape that smells like disinfectant. The quest for justice on stolen land is not immune to disease. It's withheld by the ancestors of government and employers of systems of oppression, those who profit on racism as an incentive rather than a symptom. Modern justice postponed to those who inherited the skin of survivors is not built into the altered lines of the constitution. The real taste of freedom is prison doors opening and televised images of dark bodies leading the revolution. Thank you. Woo! Okay, I wanna see that on paper. You don't have to send that to me. That was powerful. Okay, Edda, you're up. Um, I have a series of poems that reflect on Greenwood and I bring Dr. John Hope Franklin back to life. He's, as we know, our historian. Um, and it's called John Hope. So as a character, he's coming back and he's taking stock and he's looking at things. I did a collaboration with this poem um, with Alexander Taman, so I just have to give him a shout out. Um, so it's called John Hope Notes and they're just little notes and there's seven of them. I will try and read rather swiftly. 
John Hope notes, one, we came here from there. Some feet tucked in leather crafted shoes rode in a caravan. Some feet walked until their souls wore off. Everyone had a trail. Two, by serving those with hue, I broaden light in all. Three, 36 smoking blocks choke our throats. The freedom colony raised. Clouds catch the embers, rain them down. Eyes catch the ashes, rain them down. Four, comb the earth, search every trail for blood, sift the soil for bone, scrape Frisco rails for flakes of skin. In night's blanket, gather Greenwood's elements, fallen seed, popcorn kernel, darning needle, strands of pressed hair. Like magic, each becomes a proper name. Five, things from ground grow up then down, but silence is like wind. Topsoil gusts tornadic heights, bearing bodies charred and dumped. Without this lifting, they would burrow deep into the fault of earth, the next supply of sweet oil drilled and fracked for world. Six, in the sift of red dirt, I find electric rocks pulsing. I light each with lantern flame, hurl one to one oak field, one to Reconciliation Way, one to City Hall, one to Lefties, one to Mount Vernon, one, two, one, two, one, two. I march on. Seven, it is noisy. Rocks keep crying out. I blaze trails. Good stuff. Good, 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 good stuff. Thank you for that. And we actually need to talk about printing those again. Okay, Janine. So this is called Tago Nang Tago, which uh, it's a Tagalog term that roughly translates to always hiding. And a TNT is um, uh, a term that is used within the Filipino community or the Philippine next community um, to describe undocumented people within the community. So this is called Tago Nang Tago or TNT. He was petrified of them, though I can't say because of what we did that he was gullible. Once my cousin snaked the hallway and waited for him to power on the lights. He sprinted from their house to ours where we were as cold blooded shrieking, watch out from our open door. Wall cavities, attics and crawl spaces made him wet his pants. Anywhere the grass moved or seemed to move. Our poor cousin, we'd say, and Kawawa Naman when he laid low beneath the bottom bunk, waiting to surprise his mother, who we knew was not his mother saving up in the States, but a family friend with her hand out to him. He stood quietly, his shirt ironed and tucked, a good, good boy in line with his stand-in at the passport office, while we were vigilant about saying nothing that might set him off. Be a good, good girl, they said, and held me back when I stepped out of the car. I clamped my eyes shut. I could catch conjunctivitis from making eye contact. They pointed at my throat, bobbing, and said disclosing too much would make it explode. Wow. Okay. So I think we're going to have to also do an anthology of just the poems you've read today, right? So we'll start working on that one too. Fatodi, bring us home. Thank you. Thank you for reading, everyone. This particular piece is, is called Allies Activated Ode to Allies, and sometimes allies could be marginalized. 
and, it, and it's one of the poems in Release Be the Spirits of Greenwood Speak. This is called Allies Activated, Ode to Allies. Rivers of onyx, alabaster, and polychromatic complexions flood third planet's thoroughfares and collective conscious with battle cries and ardent allies after an abominable boy in blue in battle, the levy of enough is enough. He kneeled on one black neck to me. Allies aligned in solidarity declaring Black Lives Matter at the top of their indignation in the universal language of protest. They speak with a distinct riotous accent because revolution is their native tone. How did we get here? After Professor Cruel Irony cunningly revealed the reason for Colin Kaepernick kneeling, some of the cockazoid dozers who made comfy cozy in their bountiful beds of ill-gotten gain, reposing on plush pillows of privilege, covered in conspicuous coasts of complacency, were shaken awake by unheeded pleas of, I can't through dire intervals between last breaths and asphyxiation, George Floyd's soul-piercing cries for his deceased mama toward the sleeper's shame-stained veil of acquiescence to tatters. Black lives begin to matter to new allies. Well, some of my best friends are filling the blank with the social construct, but it's far from cliche these days. As introspection ignited outrage, achromatic allies realized my black children lives matter. My black parents life matters. My black wife's life matters. My black husband's life matters. My black lover's life matters. My black friends lives matter. My black teammates, coaches, students, Teachers, neighbors, lives matter. Black lives matter. Black lives matter. Black lives matter. The very colored allies, including some of the truly honorable boys and girls in blue, loudly attest in unison and fervently protest against abominable boys and girls in blue who abuse their authority with impunity. Black lives started mattering to pandering politicians, rapacious corporations, and wave-riding sports leagues when millions of the catalysts for capitalism, Caucasians in particular, decided to align with decency and declare Black Lives Matter. Empathy triggered a tectonic paradigm shift of morality as allies carved troops to power into establishments and established fluid alliances matched only by two hydrogen homies and their breathy comrade, Oxy. When organized, coordinated, and flowing steadily, allies create grand canyons and antiquated policies, fallacies, and erroneous opinions. Who knew a nefarious knee on George Floyd's neck would activate allies and be the tipping point to a revolution? Thank you. Woo! All right, so this is the best reading I've been to in quite some time. Um, thank you for all that fire from all of you all. And we are a few minutes over, so we'll wrap up. I want to I want to thank Edder. Thank you, sis. Janine, thank you, sis. Um, Ronnie, thank you, fam. For Toady, thank you, brethren. Lindsay, we're, we're on this ride together now. We're doing this thing. Maybe we're going to call it changing the narrative. Um, I don't know. We'll come up with something clever. Um, and catchy um anything you want to add Lindsay, before we wrap up i just want to give all of you my my thanks and my gratitude and it's just been wonderful to share the space with all of you and hear your wonderful words and i would just want to encourage those who joined us to keep it local come find these folks when they're giving readings buy their books um yeah just just so proud to to have had the chance to collaborate with you all. Well, thank you all for tuning in from Facebook land, wherever you may be. Thank you for, um, for hanging out with us for this hour, for uh, this conversation and this wonderful reading. Um, this uh, event will be archived on the OSU Tulsa webpage, um, should you want to share with anyone or come back and revisit um, 
spend some more time with these poems because they were all very amazing. So thank you all for tuning in. Um, thank you all again, Edder, Janine, Fatode, Amirani, Lindsay, um, and have a great, great Wednesday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank for you. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Take care, everybody.